welcome to What the Duck, a podcast with real experts talking about direct spin challenges and experiences. And now, here's your host, Source Day's very own manufacturing maven, Sarah Scudder. Thanks for joining me for What the Duck, another supply chain podcast brought to you by Source Day. I'm your host, Sarah Scudder, and this is the podcast for people working in the direct materials part of supply chain. I'm at Sarah Scudder on LinkedIn and at S Scudder on Twitter. If you are new to the show, make sure to follow this podcast so you don't miss any of our direct materials supply chain content. Today, I'm going to be joined by Tiffany Thayer, and we're going to discuss how to better secure supply. If you work for a manufacturer and are still being impacted by the international chip processing plants and export portals being shut down last year, then this episode is for you. Tiffany has worked in direct materials procurement for nearly eight years across three companies. She loves process improvement and bringing lean manufacturing practices into the front office side of business. Welcome to the show, Tiffany. Thank you for having me. So when you and I were prepping for the show, I did a little digging with some colleagues as well, and I heard you described by more than one person as a secret agent of quality. What does this mean? Yeah, so being a buyer, our supplier quality, um, I believe is in our wheelhouse to manage. And so I am able to glean a lot of data and information from my quality team, um, impact and risk impact of part levels, and then monitoring and evaluating our suppliers based on their OTD cost savings and service that level that they're providing. By monitoring those ratings with quality, they can give me a heads up when things are starting to go in a negative direction and I can go ahead and partner and build that relationship back up to a beneficial amount where we're getting our items as we need and the supplier is being proactive and suggesting cost savings. So the other thing you mentioned to go along with that is you said you view your job as essential to holding the line and maintaining a profit. Why? Yeah, so as a buyer, we're essential to maintaining a steady supply to keep production moving. And holding the line, I think, is one of the biggest things that us buyers can do to help our companies. So with cost avoidance, we're really helping our sales team, and that allows them to keep our client pricing stable. And then with cost savings, those are profit directly to the bottom line. If they had planned a component being $2 and I'm able to negotiate it down to one, then that's an extra dollar off each assembly that we're making in profit. Mm -hmm. So looking at your experience, I, I always like to go back in time a little bit on the show and figure out how people got into our crazy awesome industry. You actually have some sales experience, which I can relate to because I actually started my career in sales and, and spent several years in supply chain technology sales before pivoting into marketing. How has having sales experience benefited you as a buyer? Yeah, so I think that sales is so transferable to procurement. Um, most of it is working with different departments, working with our clients, and so all of my sales skills transferred really easily. I think that's the one that I hold on to the most is the three C's. Um, so collect, connect, and collaborate. Um, I really take a team approach to my strategy as a buyer, and I try to work in alignment with my suppliers. I don't want to squeeze out one of my suppliers to the point that they're unprofitable and I have to re um, establish the job with a new supplier that takes time it's not efficient so my goal is always to be mutually beneficial where if the supplier can give us better pricing to help us and help the customer then I want to go ahead and try and give them the most information that they can such as longer forecasting locked in bonded scheduled POs yeah I can say from my experience when I was on the the sell side 
that my favorite buyers, and, and I sold primarily into procurement and supply chain, were actually people who had been in sales themselves because I feel like they were better communicators and they understood the power of we in a relationship versus more of this like us versus you or us versus them mentality. You mentioned the three C's. I wanna make sure I, I have those down correctly. It's connect, collect, and collaborate. Um, actually, I swap it. So collect, connect, collaborate. So you okay. want to collect your network. Um, you want to connect with those individuals and then collaborate on solution solving. Got it. So how come you chose not to pursue a career in sales? You had a couple sales jobs, but then you decided to pivot. Um, to be honest with you, I got tired of making a commission-based paycheck. Um, and I felt like a lot of the sales I was doing was shoving things that people didn't need down their throats so that I could get my commission and make my rent. Um, and so I moved over to the purchasing side because it was all the same fun, but I wasn't commission based anymore. Mm -hmm. Yes, I remember the days of very, very low pay, base pay, right? Heavy, heavy commission. Stressful every end of quarter and, and every end of year. The other thing that I think is a little interesting about your background is you also have a background in accounting. So how did, did that help or benefit you in the transition to become a buyer? Yeah, so that was all the way in the beginning. Um, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do, but I know I liked money. So it seemed smart to start going to school to get my accounting degree. Um, and right out of, after receiving my AA degree, I started with a company doing half AP, half buying. I wasn't even looking at the purchasing or the buying part of it. And then once I was in that position, I just fell in love with being a buyer. Um, I think one of the benefits though, is that each department speaks its own language. Production speaks in work orders, um, accounting speaks in invoicing, sales speak in sales orders. Um, and so me having some sales, some accounting, um, I am able to translate those and speak to those departments in the language that they understand. And so I think that's the biggest benefit is just being able to break down those barriers and stop the silo of departments. Mm -hmm. So now you were in accounting, you were in sales, you pivoted into being a buyer. Now you are a senior buyer at Control Tech. What do you like most about your job? So Control Tech is an amazing company to work for. The culture, I think, is their biggest asset. Um, I have access to the C-suite. I can step in their door. We can talk about problems. We can solution, get solutions, brainstorm solutions together. Um, they really focus on bringing all of the stakeholders into a solutions meeting so that you're not failure to launch when you go to release a new process. Recently, the Columbian released an article called Clark County High Tech Ecosystem, and our principal, Stacy Smith, uh, was quoted to say that the region's high tech future is bright. And she pointed to the investments that Control Tech has been making in technical education, preparing a new generation of high tech workers. This exactly benefited me, not just me though. We have lots of employees who are benefiting from this and Control Tech has actually sponsored me for my uh, Lean Six Sigma black belt. And so them supporting me just makes our company stronger together. Mm -hmm. And, and for those that are listening that maybe aren't familiar with Six Sigma, what, is the, what does that certification mean? What's the value of that, having that? So it's mostly processing. Um, it's called Lean Six Sigma. And so Lean and Six Sigma are actually two different things. Um, but it's all about being able to improve your quality and reduce the lag time between stations so that your turn time is the fastest it can be with the highest output. Um, I am actually focused on taking some of those same principles and applying them to the front office side. Okay. 
Yeah, we'll have to, I'll have to follow your journey and see after you have the certification, what sort of impact that makes. So how do you, I feel like sometimes there's still a misconception, especially in manufacturing, that buyers just cut purchase orders or buyer just put, buyers just push paper. But I feel like you do so much more than that. So how do you add value to your company? I think that I'm really trying to shove out the mindset that buyers are transactional. Buyers can really be a strategic point in your company. Um, one of my main focuses, again, is on process improvement, focused on efficiency. So we all struggle to find more time to get more things done. No one's going to be able to insert a 25th hour into the day. So how do we find more time? The secret to finding more time is improving the current status quo. One way I do this is bulk RFQing, bucket quoting, um, automation for PO inputting, um, strategies that the, our purchasing team can use to make the bid more be mutually beneficial to us and the supplier. Uh, Roger Bannister in 1954 broke the four minute mile and previously this had been thought of as impossible, right? But he proved that it was possible. And after he broke the, that glass ceiling, tons of athletes started to be able to run a, faster than a four minute mile. I think the same principles can be put into our work day. So what I try and do is show that it's possible to do things and then collaborate with my team to fine tune it. Um, so we're creating the time. If something used to take us two hours and I can get it down automated to 20 minutes, that's an hour and a half that I now have and that's my 25th hour. Mm -hmm. What's the most important problem you've solved in the last three months? Yeah, so because of all of the long lead times for components and you know, um, export ports being shut down, COVID type of lags, uh, are, we have started using independent brokers to fill gaps in, in inventory needs. And we, I think we went up almost 400% as far as how much we're using those. So we didn't have a great process in place for counterfeit mitigation. Um, and so that's what I looked at. Um, and we were able to evaluate the AS specs aerospace standards. We also reviewed the International Organization for Standardization, the ISO certs, and we were able to identify three that would really decrease our risk using independent brokers. So AS6171 is a testing standard. AS9110 is a QM for stock list distributors and then CCAP 101 is a counterfeit avoidance program. So we built those testing requirements into acceptance of all parts. Um, we were able to analyze each purchase based on the vendor risk, the part risk, transaction risk, and assembly risk. And this really gives us a good picture of what level testing is needed and we have not had any counterfeit parts come into the plant since the program was launched. So this is interesting. Counterparts are not necessarily something that I would even think of or, or comes to mind. So is this is a pretty big problem then industry-wide? Yeah. Yeah, so currently the U.S. doesn't have any chip manufacturers, um, which to me is a really scary thing when you sit in your room and you look around you at how many things have electronic chips in it and knowing that if there was, you know, an end of times event, the U.S. has no chip manufacturers. All of that's going away. Um, and so basically, in countries that do produce chips, for example, China, they will have one facility and different manufacturers will rent out time in that facility. So the U.S. normally only accepts the top grade of those chips that are produced in those plants. However, they will actually produce grade A, grade B, grade C. 
So there's a lot more variance that you have to be careful of. And um, sometimes, you know, there's just bad people and um, they'll mislabel, mismark parts, you know, maybe it looks similar and they put a new manufacturer over it, but it's not going to work for what we need. So it's really important for us that we establish the line to the authentic um, distributor, the authorized distributor, not authentic, I apologize, the authorized distributor, and make sure that our parts are operating per manufacturer's spec. Mm -hmm. Yeah, real in interesting. I feel like that may be the a whole nother show conversation about counterfeit parts and materials because I mean now that you say it it seems obvious if we have no local production you're relying on the goodwill of other countries to yeah send you what we're they really need. lucky though actually the chips act was recently signed and they are going to start building some manufacturers within the US so things are looking up but that's mm -hmm. gonna take a couple years for them to get on the boots rolling so the topic of our chat today is how to better secure supply and you mentioned that one of the major challenges you had to overcome is long lead time. So would like to have you explain what is a long lead time because what I'm thinking in my mind may be completely different than what you're experiencing and then how did you fix this problem? I mean it seems like it's not fixable. Yeah, so I think fix is a pretty strong word <laughs> um, but what am i doing to proactively manage it right so a long lead time to me anywhere from 32 55 72 and allocated parts could be as far out as 99 weeks um so what are we doing to overcome this a couple things i'm trying to strengthen the relationship with my program managers because I, the more communication I can get down to our customers, um, something I was working on today was doing a bomb lead time for them. So if our customers have the correct lead times in their systems, their ERP should be forecasting, letting them know how far in advance to place orders with us. And then on our side, um, we're able to go off a few things. I would say it's about 25% historic you know, have we ran this job for several years? What's the standard run rate? 50% is based on the booked sales orders. And um, about 25% of it, I would just call magic. And uh, for those that, that may not know, uh, what, what's a bomb? A bill of materials. So the bill of materials is going to list out each component and how many per build. And so then I try to work smarter, not harder. And my, a lot of my distributors have software. They can just upload it. It's gonna output ex the lead times, pricing, all of that. So I just send it to them. And that's how, what's well, one another way where managing the relationship helps me get my stuff done more efficiently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you, you've mentioned multiple times supplier relationships, improving supplier relationships. How do, how do you go about doing this? I mean, you and other buyers are just so, so busy throughout the day. How do you even have time to focus on and prioritizing these relationships? I just like talking and checking in with people. Um, so that's a little bit of my gift of gap. But I think that using rich communication channels help me to build those relationships. Um, I like to set really clear expectations with my suppliers. Um, it, like one of my expectations is when I'm doing their supplier scorecards, I will rate them based on their cost savings. And so the top score is reserved for suppliers who are being proactive and suggesting things that can give us cost savings or reduce our costs or reduce our lead time, reduce transit costs, things like that. And so by setting up the expectation with them that they, if they wanna get a top score, they have to propose ideas back, kind of helps get that started. Um, you were asking, 
you know, why supplier relationships are so important. And this one is, I like to reference it to like breaking down in with your car. So when you have a strong relationship with your suppliers, it's like breaking down with your car on the side of the road. If I call my best friend and I'm like, hey, my car broke down, it's an emergency, I need you. They're gonna be there for me. I've had CSRs who have gone out to the production line and boxed my components. I have had sales reps who have gone to bat for me against their managers to, so we can get better bonded pricing. Those are the people who can work the magic within your suppliers organizations. And so that's why it's so important. I can throw you know, my weight around all I want, but having somebody in the inside who wants to mention your company or your guys' project on the inside and elevate it to a position of priority is going to get you better service. That then brings me to a, another question around what skills do you think buyers need to be good at supplier relationships? Because I would argue someone who's been in the industry for 30 or 40 years may not necessarily have the skill set that's needed today to work on this collaboration. Um, what skills are needed? I mean, I think that you have to be a people person. I think that you need to have organization. Um, you need to be, have creativity. You know, if you look at the, your, your workload as individual items that you have to touch, it's so slow, you know? So be, by being creative and knowing how you can take your commodity of direct materials or um, whatever commodity you're buying and make it appealing to your suppliers. When I'm bidding a small run, like so let's say cut tape of 15 pieces and they're five cents a piece, no supplier is going to care. But when I give them a bucket quote, you know, of a hundred of these and the total order is now $300, they're gonna care a little bit more. So definitely those communication skills, outside the box thinking and organization, I think are pretty important. Well, thank you for discussing today how to better secure supply, Tiffany. Where would you like to send people to find you? Yeah, they can just find me on LinkedIn, Tiffany Thayer, T-H-A-Y-E-R. If you missed anything, you can check out the show notes. You can find us by typing in What the Duck, another supply chain podcast in Google. To have optimal search results, make sure to add another supply chain podcast at the end of your search. To ensure you don't miss a single episode, make sure to follow this podcast and subscribe to us on YouTube. I'm at Sarah Scudder on LinkedIn and at S. Scudder on Twitter. This brings us to the end of another episode of What the Duck, another supply chain podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Scudder, and we'll be back next week. Mm -hmm.